Good morning, folks. Welcome to God in Genesis class. Today's lesson is entitled Covenant Established. It's lesson number 29 from the God in Genesis series. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 17 as a study passage this morning. Sky Jethany, in preaching today, shares the following. A few years before I married my wife, Amanda, she bought a car with the help of her dad. They went to a dealership, and they had found a car they really liked. She called me to get my opinion, and I felt really uncomfortable. I knew Amanda's dad really liked the car, and he was the one helping her pay for it, not me. But I thought the car was junk. But I was just the boyfriend. Who am I to dictate what they should do, I thought. I told Amanda to do whatever her dad thought was best. I figured it was not my car, not my problem. Two years later, when we got married, the car became my problem. 1,000 miles after the warranty expired, the transmission gave out. Although I was tempted to do so, I didn't turn to Amanda and say, you bought this lousy car. This is your problem. We were married. Her problems, regardless of where they came from, were my problems. When we enter into the new covenant relationship with God, He takes us on along with all of our issues. He is committed to making this relationship work. He not only gives us salvation, but is committed to sanctifying us as well. We also have commitments in the relationship. We also have our part to play. He works on us and we submit to His working. We respond to His outreach and love toward us. Okay, in introducing our lesson this morning. Today's lesson is about the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God established with Abraham in which he promised him many descendants in a homeland. The establishment of the covenant with Abram involved the implementation of circumcision as a sign and the giving of a new name to Abram and his wife Sarai. Abram was 99 years old in our lesson today. He lived to be 175 years old. So he was about halfway there, halfway through his lifespan. God had appeared to Abraham 13 years. God was now appearing to Abraham 13 years after his last appearance. His biological clock was ticking right along. And his, as I mentioned, his last recorded interaction with God was about 13 years before when God had given him the promise and had walked between the sacrifices with him. They were years of quiet, years of raising a son by Hagar, years of wondering, years perhaps of losing touch with God, years of remorse for going his own way. But God had a plan. God always has a plan. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows that I'm recording this Sunday school lesson by myself before class because of COVID-19. He knows that you are listening and watching the PowerPoint video on your computer or tablet or phone so that you can keep up, so that we can keep our social distances. God was not finished with Abram because of his latest stumble of faith. The time was getting close for Abram to have the promised son. God's daybook planner said, meet with Abraham today. It's one year to Isaac time. Get Abram and Sarah ready. Change their names. Tell Abram about the covenant that we have. It's going to be an everlasting covenant that his descendants will be many, very many, that I will give them this land of Canaan forever. Okay, we want to read the study passage at this point. It's from Genesis 17, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, But your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceeding fruitful, 
And I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations, their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from an, any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his Son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abram and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Okay, the first issue that we want to look, up, look at is the issue of being set apart for God. The Abrahamic covenant set apart his descendants as a special people. The most special of his offspring would be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Through Christ, we join Abraham's family as his spiritual descendants. What does it mean to be set apart for God? What did it mean for the Jewish people, the Hebrew people? What does it mean for us today as Christians? What does it mean to be set apart for God? The process is called sanctification. I know that sounds like a big word and it sounds a little scary. The process is called sanctification. And from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, I have the following. Sanctification, the process of God's grace by which the believer is separated from sin and becomes dedicated to God's righteousness. Accomplished by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Sanctification results in holiness or purification from the guilt and power of sin. Something we should mention right away is that first comes salvation and then sanctification. Sanctification is not accomplished on an unbeliever. Sanctification being set apart doesn't happen to the uh, one who is not saved first. And in Abraham's case, uh, we could consider his salvation to be when he stepped out in faith at God's command. When he believed God. 
Abram had stepped out in faith. Abram had left his old life and country, which can symbolize the old life that we leave behind. A quote from D.L. Moody. He says, When I was converted, I made this mistake. I thought the battle was already mine, the victory already won, the crowd already in my grasp. I thought the old things had passed away, that all things had become new, and that my old corrupt nature, the old life, was gone. But I found out, after serving Christ for a few months, that conversion was only like enlisting in the army, that there was a battle on hand. Very apt uh, observation there by D.L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody. We cannot be holy and set apart of ourselves. It is the work of God that happens in us. Our own efforts will result in hypocrisy and failure at best. We are not saved by our sanctification and holiness. It is a process that begins in our lives after we are born again. How long does it take to become a Christian? A moment. And, in a sense, a lifetime. Number four, Abram experienced a period of possible backsliding due to his listening to Sarai and trying to fulfill God's plan through his own efforts. Thirteen years, thirteen years ago, he made the mistake of trying to help God by having a son through his servant girl. And uh, I think there was, this may have been a a period of... of, uh, some real questioning in his life, possibly discouragement, uh, and uh, a life that maybe wasn't lived in victory so much and in faith. What is it that can end a drought like that? We've all gone through droughts in our lives, dry times in our lives where we feel out of touch with God, and then it eventually ends. What, What brings an end to that? A quote from a Jean-Nicolas Gros, he says, When in his mercy God leads a soul into the higher plane of sanctification, he begins by stripping it of all self-confidence. And to this end, he allows our own schemes to fail, our judgment to mislead us. We grope and totter and make countless mistakes until we learn wholly to mistrust ourselves and to put all our confidence in him. So true. What did it take in the case of Abram to bring him out of that slump? It took a visit from God. And the first verse of our study passage says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. God is so faithful in making these visits. God is so faithful in continuing to come to us. He keeps coming back into our lives He keeps offering his grace to us. God condemned the Laodicean church in the time of John the Revelator. They were lukewarm. They were neither cold nor hot. He threatened to spew them out of his mouth. In chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, we read that great verse that was spoken to this backsliding church. Let me read for you. Revelation 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I think that that God continues to knock. God continues to patiently come back to us, continue to, to try to establish communication with us. And he comes and knocks on the door for us and, and, can, and wants to fellowship with us and wants to be with us and to start his work of sanctification in us. Continue his work of sanctification. Okay, the next area we want to look at is covenant prerequisites. What were the prerequisites that God had for Abraham in order to establish this covenant with him? There were some prerequisites, and they are listed in the first two verses of our study passage. Genesis 17, verses 1 and 2. Let me read that again. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And the first prerequisite that I see in this couple of verses is a clear picture of God. I think the prerequisite for God uh, setting us apart, for uh, being our God, the God of our covenant, is, is a, that we have a good picture of who he is. 
And I get that thought from the uh, verse 1 there. He says, I am God Almighty. When he comes to Abram, and we don't know exactly in what form he was there in God, in, when he appeared to Abram, maybe as the pre-incarnate Christ, possibly. Uh, we see that in the next chapter, uh, Genesis 18. But he came to Abram and he said, I am God Almighty. You need to understand, that's who I am. We need, if we are going to be uh, sanctified, if we are to be set apart in this new covenant relationship, we need to understand what God is, His glory, His, His sufficiency, His power. Shaddai is the name for God that is first used here. It is used as El Shaddai. El is, is the, the Hebrew for God. Shaddai has to do with being almighty. The God who is able to provide, the God who does not change. He is the covenant God for the patriarchs. El Shaddai is used 49 times in the Old Testament. And I would note that especially in the book of Job, it's used 31 times as God as being a powerful God. Of course, Job understood that. Robert Dick Wilson, who served at Princeton Seminary at the beginning of the 20th century, used to go listen whenever one of the alumni would come back to preach. He used to say, when my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders, and then I know what their ministry will be. Robert Dick Wilson makes the point that in order for ministry to be effective, in order for our lives to be consecrated to God, to be set apart to God, that we need to have a big picture of God. We need to have a clear picture of God. If we have a big view of God, if we think a lot of Him, if we trust Him, if we obey Him, He will take up a big place in our lives. Sin has as much of its origin a small view of God. Abraham felt that, if he, that he had to make things happen, so he ran ahead of God. He is all, God is all sufficient in himself. He does not need our help. Abraham, I think, was trying to help God. In business, we don't have to scheme. He is sufficient for us. If we are poor, we do not need to fret or worry because he will provide. If we feel weak and helpless... We turn, we turn to him for strength and reassurance. We know that he sees and will provide what is necessary for our benefit. So that's the first prerequisite, I think, of, of being set apart for God, of God establishing his covenant and setting us apart for himself is a clear picture of God. Secondly, walking before God. I take that from verse 1 again. He says, I am God Almighty, God speaking to Abram, walk before me, and be blameless, walking before God. I'd like for you to take a minute to con contemplate that, walking before God. What is that about? Walking before God, walking in God's presence, walking with the understanding that God is looking at us, walking with the understanding that God sees us and that we are, we are in fact, uh, walking before Him. Abram had walked before Sarah, followed her wishes more than he should have. Abram had walked in the sight of his own eyes. God asked him to walk before him, a continuous sense of his presence, making decisions in light of his presence. Most people make decisions, decisions, decisions as if God did not exist. The Bible says there is no fear of God before their eyes. The mark of a sanctified man is that everything he does or says, is done as if in the presence of the Almighty, as indeed it is. Are you aware that God is with you? We forget. I do. And we get all carried away with whatever and forget that God is right here. Does the presence of God make a difference in the way you live your life, in, in what ways you, you do? We should not live in terror or apprehension of God, but we should walk in awareness that He is there. The Bible clearly teaches that. It should affect everything that we do. The third prerequisite for the covenant, I believe, in God's case, was using God's standard for holiness. Um, the last part of verse 1. I am God Almighty, he says, and walk before me and be blameless. God knows that we'll never be without fault. 
You say, surely God doesn't expect me to be perfect. My question to you is, do you think that he should lower his standard of holiness because I cannot attain it? Do you think he should say, walk before me and be as good as you can? Does that sound right? Walk before me and give it a good try. Walk before me and just be yourself. God is absolutely holy and that is his standard for us. He gave us his son as the perfect example of that. A quote from John Boykin. He says, many Christians feel more comfortable with the idea that apart from Christ they can do nothing than they do with the other side of that coin, that they can do all things through him who strengthens them. I can do nothing, lets me off the hook. I can do all things, makes me wonder why I'm not doing anything. It's easier to piddle around wondering whether it's God's will that you rent this apartment or that one than it is to face up to God's ultimate will for you that you become conformed to the image of his son. I see that attitude so prevalent in our modern Christian culture is that I can't do anything. And therefore that lets me off the hook. It absolutely does not. God's standard is what we want to look at. He he wants to conform us to the image of his son. He is our hero. We need to follow the example that Paul outlines in Philippians where he, he talks about straining forward in our Christian experience. Philippians 3 verse 7, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I had already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and that if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. I'd like to go next to uh, the book of 1 Peter. Peter also gives some excellent advice. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We are set apart for God. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now are you God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The fourth prerequisite is the giving of the covenant was conditioned by Abram's walk before God. This is a concept that I I need to get across to us. The giving of the covenant was conditioned by Abram's walk before God. There would be those who teach that his covenant was without condition. I've, I've read that quite a bit in my studies for this class, that it was an unconditional covenant. I disagree strongly. The basis for that disagreement is the first part of verse 2. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. He, gave, he gives the prerequisites in verse 1. Walk before me and be blameless. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. There's conditional. The word that there is conditional. God knew that Abram's response would be good. His foreknowledge. He is able to tell what folks' choices will be. He is able to know what we, how will we will be respond. But he does give us that choice to make that good response. 
If Abram had responded badly, God could not have given him the covenant. God makes the first move, but he gives the choice of how we will respond. It's always that way. Finally, Abram and Sarai were given new names. And we're very familiar with that uh, that change. We talked about it the last time when we looked at the covenant, uh, that ceremony that they had when God walked between the, uh, the cut up pieces of animals with Abram. God changed Abram's name. It was customary, I'm told, when the covenant was made like that between two parties, that they, they would take each other's name in, as a part of their name. And God's name is Jehovah. And that ah, if, if we translate it that way, the A-H now was added to Sarah's name and to Abram's name. It was Abraham, Abram before, now it becomes Abraham. That A-H was put into Abram's name. And Sarai now became Sarah. And so we have God being a part of their identity. Abram becomes Abram, Sarai becomes Sarah. And God was a huge part of their identity. Okay, next we want to move on to the issue of circumcision. And this is a big part of our study passage. And it's a topic that uh, we don't talk about a lot in today's culture. It's, uh, it's not something that figures largely in our Christian culture, and rightly so. But it did figure largely in the covenant that God made with Abraham. First point I'd like to make with that is God gave the covenant the badge of circumcision. It was a badge or a sign of the covenant. It was a sign that um, you were complying with the covenant. All males at the age of eight days, were to be circumcised. Sons, servants, slaves, they were given a name and were circumcised. They were identified forever with the covenant that their father Abraham, or their master Abraham, had received from God himself. Circumcision was performed by the dad in the earlier days. No doctor here, just dad or mom or somebody with a sharp knife or a stone or something. Anyone who didn't have it done was cut off from his people. I'm I'm never quite sure what all that means. But if you were a a Hebrew and you didn't circumcise uh, your newborn male, newborn child, newborn son, if you didn't circumcise him, you were disregarding the covenant that God had with Abram. And you were to be cut off. You were ostracized from your people, which is, I believe, what happened. Not necessarily that you were killed. But you were ostracized. You were no longer part of that covenant. Circumcision was later prescribed in the Mosaic Law. And uh, was promptly neglected during the wanderings in the wilderness. I don't know if they just didn't uh, feel like doing it. Or they were occupied with other things. Or made mostly survival and so on. But they didn't do it during the wilderness. And when they got to the, uh, the promised land. All these young people that had never been circumcised were circumcised before they moved on into Canaan. Circumcision was a badge of distinction. It was a mark of distinction. It was a bad badge that the Hebrews wore proudly, if you could put it that way. I mean, yeah, obviously you couldn't tell with their clothes on. But they were circumcised. They, were, they wore that very proudly. They were proud of the fact that they were God's chosen people. They were the circumcised ones. And those who were not circumcised, the Gentiles were called that, the uncircumcised. So that was a badge of distinction that was going on there. It was fostered a sense of pride and exclusivity. I'm told that the daily prayer of strict Jewish males was to thank God that he was neither a woman, a Samaritan, or a Gentile. proud of the fact that he was a Hebrew male. The Gentiles were referred to as the uncircumcised. The issue of circumcision brought great debate in the early church. As you can imagine, the transition from a Jewish uh, religion, if you will, Jewish, uh, the law, to uh, Christianity 
There was a period of time there where, where this thing of circumcision was uh, hotly debated. Devout Christian Jews were circumcised. Devout Christians such as John the Baptist, Jesus, Jesus was circumcised, Paul was. Paul circumcised Timothy after he took him into ministry with him. And many of the early believers felt that a Gentile would need to enter into the Abrahamic covenant before he could become a believer in Christ. Peter was the first to move out into the Gentile world with his witness, spreading the gospel into the Gentile world by going to speak to Cornelius in his household. And he was roundly criticized for doing that. You went into the uncircumcised, they said. And you talked with them. You ate with them. You associated with them. And Peter, uh, I'm sure, felt that criticism. But it had been a direct command from God to not call anyone unclean. And so, uh, as time went on, there the landmark decision was made in the early church that circumcision among the Gentiles was not necessary to come to Christ. There was a new covenant, in fact, that was being put in place what we call the New Covenant. It is not the old Abrahamic Covenant. Paul later made it clear in his writings that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. I want to support that with some scriptures. Romans 2.25 For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter His praise is not from man, but from God. Basically, in the new covenant, the one who is set apart for God is is one which is circumcised inwardly, in in the heart. The cutting away of sin in the heart, uh, symbolically. Another scripture, Galatians 6, verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Also 1 Corinthians 7 verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Physical circumcision for the Christian is a non-issue in itself. It may be accomplished, and and many parents accomplish it for other reasons, but not as, as a part of the covenant. The symbolism embodied in the ritual of circumcision is of value to us as we look at the life of Abraham. Those who were circumcised were set apart. They were different from those around them. They identified with God and His covenant. They stood out. They were sometimes ostracized. They were not a part of the crowd of unbelievers around them. And circumcision was a mark of identity to the little Hebrew boy. It set him apart from his Gentile counterparts forever. The closest equivalent to circumcision in the Christian faith is the rite of baptism. And I was surprised as I studied this issue how much similarity there is between the the rite of baptism that we believe is commanded for us as Christians to that of circumcision, which was commanded in the covenant with Abraham. It was a command, 
like baptism is a command. Baptism is only for qualified believers, and baptism doesn't save us. It is, however, loaded with, with, with uh, symbolism. In baptism, we identify with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. And as such, there is a tremendous witness to those around us that we are identified with Christ. And we are identified with those believers who are with Christ. And we become part of a visible body of believers. And I think in that case, baptism is is a lot like circumcision. Okay, the the process of sanctification, being set apart, is what we want to look at next. And start off with a definition. The process of God's grace by which the believer is separated from sin... And becomes dedicated to God's righteousness. Sanctification is a process of God's grace. By which the believer is separated from sin. And becomes dedicated to God's righteousness. We know the righteousness is not our own. But we become dedicated to it. We become set apart to God's righteousness. This definition is taken from Nelson's Bible Dictionary. It's accomplished by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, working through the Word of God. That's what, how sanctification is, is accomplished. I want to read a couple of supporting scriptures for that concept. John 17, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that she might be holy, and without blemish. Sanctification results in holiness or purification from the guilt and power of sin. There are two parts to sanctification. I'm going to probably get some feedback on this, possibly from some of you. There are two parts to sanctification. The first part is that God does the work in our lives. And I'm going to stress this part because God is the one who sanctifies us. Through his word, through the work of his Holy Spirit, we were powerless to sanctify ourselves. His grace in our lives is the important thing here. It is impossible for us to accomplish that good work of sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So God is the one who does the work. Secondly, I want to say that we cooperate. That is our part, is cooperation. We can't do the work of sanctification. In our own strength, we have no ability to be holy. It is God working His holiness in our lives. However, we need to cooperate with God. We can do that or we can resist God's working. Romans 6, to substantiate this, Romans 6 verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Clearly, clearly, clearly this passage teaches that the presenting of ourselves, the cooperation that we do with God through our Presenting the members of our body to God in cooperation to His working is a part of that process of sanctification. It doesn't happen overnight. It won't happen in a year. 
in 10 years. It will never be complete in this life. Our salvation is complete. It's the finished work of Christ. Our sanctification is ongoing. A, an illustration for this ongoing sanctification from a Misty Mori from Roseville, Minnesota. She says, A man once bought a home with a tree in the backyard. It was winter and nothing marked this tree as different from any other tree. When spring came, the tree grew leaves and tiny pink buds. How wonderful, thought the man, a flower tree. I will enjoy its beauty all summer. But before he had time to enjoy the flowers, the wind began to blow. And soon all the petals were strewn in the yard. What a mess, he thought. This tree isn't any use after all. The summer passed. And one day the man noticed the tree was full of green fruit, the size of large nuts. He picked a large one and took a bite. He cried out and threw it to the ground. What a horrible taste. This tree is worthless. Its flowers are so fragile the wind blows them away and its fruit is terrible and bitter. When winter comes, I'm cutting it down. But the tree took no notice of the man and continued to draw water from the ground and warmth from the sun and in late fall produced crisp red apples. Some of us see Christians with this early blossoms of happiness and think they should be that way forever. Or we see bitterness in their lives and we're sure they will never bear the f- better fruit of joy. Could it be that we forget some of the best fruit ripens late? There are promises to the, one, to the ones who are sanctified. I want to conclude this class with a couple of promises. I'd just like you to listen to the promises to those who submit to God's working in their lives and setting us apart for Him and in pruning us, in working with us and bringing us to better sanctification. First from 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This is sanctification. Us yielding ourselves to God's working and being set apart for God. And then we become part of God's family. He receives us into his family and we become uh, more like him. Revelation 7 verses 9 to 15. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serving him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence." Covenant established. God established his covenant with Abraham. He promised him uh, many, many seeds, nations. Many nations would come from him. And those many nations include us as believers today. We are part of the new covenant that was established. And the new uh, family of God, if you want to put it that way. The new group that God has chosen out. We are part of that group. And we are also, in the sense, uh, Abraham's spiritual children. God bless you.